hear any words? Is that? Yes. Not one of the promotional trailers for the sci-fi film Arrival showed the aliens in full. To what do they look like? You'll see soon enough. But we don't see soon enough. All you get are these two fuzzy impressions looming out of the fog. And all you can really tell is that whatever these things are, they're different. The question of what alien life would look like is something that has captivated humans for centuries. How would evolution progress on a different world? And what would a highly intelligent alien look like? Would it look anything like us? Now, if you're like me, you've thought about this question a lot. And maybe you've noticed that science communicators tend to push the idea that intelligent aliens will probably look very different than we do. After all, evolution on Earth has produced so many different body plans, and many of those bodies share common traits. For example, complex eyes have independently evolved at least a dozen times. They've evolved in worms, in mollusks, in jellyfish, and arthropods even emerging from different cell and tissue types. This begs the question, if a complex feature like an eye can evolve in a variety of organisms, isn't it possible that advanced brains could also develop in a wide range of alien life? It seems overly restrictive to assume that high intelligence could only ever evolve on animals with humanoid form, two legs, two arms, and a head. Neil deGrasse Tyson has made this point. But you're really going to get a humanoid thing from another planet with another origin story than what we have here on Earth? That's odd. Eric Weinstein has said something similar, even going so far as to say this. Beware of any discussion of unrelated aliens that have tetrapod body plants. Take a long, hard look at intelligent mollusks on Earth. That's the closest we have to the aliens. The odds of unrelated tetrapod aliens is just, I can't even believe we're having this discussion. Sorry. You can see in that tweet that this question can bring out some feelings, which brings us back to movie trailers. The makers of these trailers aren't just hiding the alien to keep your curiosity alive. They're also hiding it to avoid your biases. Every person has their own deep ideas about what aliens might look like. And sometimes seeing something brought to life can clash with our ideas, leading to a negative response. There are so many emotions at play here, even in scientists, even in physicists and mathematicians. But if we want to make the best predictions we can about what intelligent aliens look like, we have to set our expectations aside. We also need to think not like physicists or mathematicians, but more like Darwin, more like Bill Hamilton, Stephen Jay Gould, and Peter Ward. We have to think like evolutionary biologists. One thing that evolutionary theory tells us is that traits like eyes that can evolve on different body plans are not the rule. Some traits seem to only evolve in specific environments and only on organisms that have certain prerequisite traits. Powered flight has only evolved three times in terrestrial animals, pterosaurs, birds, and bats. These organisms' body plans do have some differences, but they're also deep, commonalities. Forelimbs are used as wings, hind limbs as a rudder, and there are never more than two wings. This should make us pause, because if I was a pterosaur, and I was dreaming of what a flying alien might look like, and I was imagining something like something with a balloon-like body, or something with helicopter hands, or a biological jetpack, and someone showed me an alien that looked like a bird or a bat, I'd be pretty disappointed. And I would start wondering, why didn't I see this coming? There is strong evidence that pterosaurs, birds, and bats look similar because they all took a similar evolutionary path to flight. The weird thing about wings is that if you have them, it's great. You can see for miles, you can spot different resources. You've got this beautiful advantage. But evolution moves slowly. And if your lineage is in the process of evolving wings, but you can't actually fly it, you've just got these little proto-wing nubs, this isn't an advantage. This is actually a cost. You've got this dead weight, and you're not getting anything in return for it. And if you're going to continue evolving, your lineage has to survive with this dead weight 
for thousands of generations, even as the nubs get bigger and bigger and the dead weight gets worse and worse and worse. In most environments and in most animals, this isn't going to happen. One of Darwin's great realizations was that 50% of animals in the forest die of starvation. The world is harsh. Natural selection will prune any evolutionary experiment before it can make much progress in a bad direction. So there's this big barrier to entry for flight before you can get to the good stuff. How and when can evolution get past it? This is a good question to ask because big brains also have a big barrier to entry. Thinking is expensive and most animals don't need to think like we do to solve the basic problems of food, shelter, and reproduction. Of course, if you've got a big human brain, you've got a great advantage. But if a mouse in the desert starts evolving a powerful brain, we're really just making a less efficient mouse. What's needed for both flight and brains is what I would call a stepping stone environment, a place and time where having these little proto wings is actually useful, something that can bridge the gap between no wings and full wings. Small, efficient brain, crazy powerful brain. We'll come back to brains in a moment, but for now, let's stick with the example of flight. On Earth, the stepping stone environment for flight appears to be trees. Animals that live in treetops spend a lot of time leaping from tree to tree to reach new resources. At some point, a small tree-living creature might have a mutation that gives it a little flap of skin. And this little flap of skin acts as a little glider, so the animal can reach just a little further when it jumps. And that translates into an advantage. Over time, that flap of skin becomes larger and larger, but only because every increase in the size of the flap also yields an ever greater advantage in flight distance. Eventually, the flap of skin might reach a limit. And now the next advantage comes when that little animal starts gyrating its shoulders a bit, right? Pumping and producing tiny amounts of thrust, helping it reach even further. For bats, this intermediate organism is, of course, the beautiful flying squirrel, which has been so successful with its little proto wings that it is still around today. The same story applies to birds. The Archaeopteryx lineage evolved in trees. They hopped, then glided, then flew. And while we don't yet have the fossil of the pterosaur intermediate, analysis of pterosaur skeletons indicates that it too most likely evolved from a quadrupedal lizard that lived in trees. So trees are really important. They're the stepping stone on the evolutionary path to powered flight. And you can even see in modern times some organisms that are on this path right now. The Draco lizard, which lives in the Philippines and soars from tree to tree, or the flying snakes of Southeast Asia, which flatten their entire bodies to glide great distances. However, unlike Archaeopteryx and flying squirrels, this snake might be stuck in the trees. Without limbs and leverage to generate thrust, it may never evolve powered flight. It's in the right environment, but it doesn't have the prerequisite traits to go any further. This is what I would call an evolutionary filter. Many different body shapes can enter the gliding stage, but on Earth, only organisms with limbs may be capable of progressing to full powered flight. Limbs are a prerequisite. I wonder what else limbs might be a prerequisite for. Let's talk about human intelligence. Peregrine falcons are extremists in speed, the fastest animals to ever live, 300 miles per hour in a dive. Blue whales, extremists in size, largest animals in our planet's history. And humans are extremists in a few specific types of brain power. The common protest here is that plenty of other animals also have very competent brains. And yes, just as cheetahs are also fast, and elephants are also large, dolphins and octopuses are also seriously smart. But there are a few ways in which the human brain is special. Abstract thought. Hey honey, can you go pick up some orange juice for the brunch tomorrow? That sentence has time, spatial location, planning, and social interactions, all in a few seconds. Humans are also special in manipulating the environment around us to solve problems. Hi honey, me again. I've actually just remembered you're a rocket scientist. And you're probably really busy right now, so I'll just order the OJ on Uber Eats. 
This doesn't mean that other animals don't have beautiful brains that are beautifully adapted for love or hunting or maneuvering through social situations. But where it comes to concepts, tools, and rocket building, we are the Peregrine Falcons. We are the extremists of intelligence. So how did we get here? What were the stepping stone environments? What were the prerequisite traits? And how common will these things be on other planets? One of the prerequisites for tool use and rocket building is the ability to manipulate the environment. This requires a grasping appendage, a primate's hand, a rodent's claw, an octopus tentacle. How can a manipulating appendage evolve? One of the simplest ways is for a pair of limbs that were used for walking to become free, a transition from quadrupedalism to bipedalism. Legs, or walking on stilts, minimizes friction and allows for joints and levers and muscles to transfer energy to the ground. And levers and muscles are efficient. In theory, the fewer legs you have touching the ground, the more efficient you are. Sure enough, in environments on Earth where patches of food are sparse and separated by great distances, you may find bipedal animals. In barren central Australia, kangaroos roam the prairies. In the dry dust bowl of Arizona, the kangaroo mouse, the fearsome kangaroo mouse, which is not related to kangaroos, travels long distances between patches of water. A similar story gave rise to our bipedal primate ancestors. Eight million years ago, when our lineage branched off from chimps, Central Africa experienced brutal climate change and deforestation. Forests still existed, but they were small, they were patchy, and they were separated by dry, barren grasslands. Our ancestors were forced to travel great distances between these patches to find food and water and shelter. These kinds of climate change events will almost certainly take place on alien worlds, and they may encourage more efficient means of walking freeing up appendages for other functions. But just being bipedal is not enough to gift an animal with excellent manipulators. Our ancestors had spent their lives supporting their body weight by their hands. This required a seriously strong grip and an opposable thumb. Kangaroos, kangaroo mice, and early dinosaurs did not have this. They had free appendages, but not for grasping for clawing, for digging, for striking. So we found our first stepping stone environment, climate change and patchy resources, which favors efficient travel and bipedalism. But we've also found our first prerequisite trait. The organism also needs to have strong grasping appendages to start with. So this is already a fairly narrow evolutionary path, but it's about to get even narrower. Bipedalism appears in our ancestors about 7 million years ago. And while brain size does seem to get larger, it doesn't take off in size. If anything, brain size stays fairly stable for a few million years. We needed another push, another stepping stone, something to encourage the hugely expensive brains of modern humans. The kind of brain that can solve problems in a sophisticated way. What kind of environment encourages an animal to solve problems? Well, definitely an environment that has problems, but what kind of problems? All organisms face difficulties, but they don't build tools and rocket ships. So what was special about our ancestors' difficulties? Most organisms have similar problems to solve. Food, shelter, finding mates, evading predators. But for some organisms, their environment makes one or two of these problems really, really hard to solve. Camels have an especially hard time finding food. Jungle lizards have an especially hard time evading predators. And whales have an especially hard time finding mates in the vast oceans. For each of those problems, natural selection has favored a physiological solution, a physical trait that allows the camel to store fat a lizard to deter predators with spines, or a whale to hear its true love song hundreds of miles away. But what happens when an organism has all of the problems at the same time? After the forests had been decimated, our ancestors' world continued to change and not for the better. The land became drier, the forests more rare. 
Great beasts that specialized in eating grasses roamed the savanna, and huge predators that specialized in killing them lurked in the shadows. Previously, our ancestors had managed to scrape by, roaming between patches of forest, but now they were forced into the open. Patches of food were still separated by great distances, but now water was hard to come by. There was no easy shelter. The days were hot, the nights were cold, and saber-toothed tigers crisscrossed the land like searchlights. Most animal lineages that had started off in a jungle would not be able to adapt to environmental change like this. There are just so many separate challenges, so many different things going wrong at once. But there may have been one evolutionary path left for our ancestors, one final hope. Powerful brains, brains that were so expensively strong that they could solve almost any problem at the same time. Lots of biologists like to call humans generalists. Generalist animals are things like raccoons and sharks, animals that can eat most things, sleep almost anywhere. But our ancestors didn't have anywhere to sleep. They didn't have fruit to pick out of garbage cans. They couldn't just be generalists. They had to exploit. They had to squeeze resources out of places most animals couldn't dream of finding them. They had to make tools, solve problems, and hack the world. And so I would argue that this is a second stepping stone, having lots of different problems. But this path is only available to an organism that has already come through the first stepping stone. It already has strong gripping appendages and it already has them free. There's no use solving problems in your head if you can't put the solution into reality. Hominid brain size slowly increased until about 2.5 million years ago when it begins to plateau again, until suddenly it explodes out of nowhere, rising, rising, rising to modern levels. This third jump in the development of brain growth means that the evolutionary path we're talking about is about to get even narrower. What was this final stepping stone that caused the big brain explosion? For me, one of the strongest, simplest ideas has to do with a single environmental miracle, fire. 2.5 million years ago, right around the time we see this massive growth in brain size, we also see the first traces of fire use. What does fire have to do with brain development? Well, fire can help digest things. When a lion eats a pound of meat, it spends energy making loads of enzymes and compounds to break down that meat. When a human eats a pound of cooked meat, we net far more energy than that lion does. Not only does the fire pre-break down the food for us, but we also don't need to invest in big guts and powerful stomachs. With our energy restrictions lifted, the hominid brain could reach new heights. And here we are today. To summarize, we've identified three possible stepping stones to human intelligence. Patchy resources, encouraging bipedalism, diverse environmental problems all at once, and fire. In addition, we've also got three prerequisites, free appendages, strong grips, and enough curiosity to play with fire instead of running away from it. When compared to flight, this evolutionary path for intelligence is far more constrained, far more narrow. Perhaps this is why flight has evolved three separate times on our planet, while intelligence like ours has only evolved once. Now, does this mean that there are no other paths in the cosmos to developing a brain that can solve problems like we can? No, of course not. It would be asinine to fully discount alternate paths in an infinite universe. But it would also be asinine to ignore the narrowness of our path on Earth. Many distant planets are going to have thin atmospheres. Many alien animals are going to have legs. But in order to solve problems, you need to grasp things effectively. In order to grasp, you need to stand up and free your graspers. Like We're not limited by our imaginations here. We're limited by evolutionary sequences and viable strategies at a given time. If someone told you they saw a little gray alien with arms, legs, and a big old head, we should not be saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Aliens will definitely look weirder than that. 
we should probably be saying, yeah, that might be exactly what we'd expect to see. Doesn't mean we should believe them, but we shouldn't dismiss their sighting just based on the body plan that they're reporting, right? The body plan actually makes some sense. Our type of intelligence is associated with bipedalism and grasping digits. The two are linked. So of course we might find a bipedal alien. Evolution is not a painter with a canvas doing whatever it wants. Evolution is a genome on a journey. It's constrained by paths. So if we meet an alien with arms, legs, and a head, we shouldn't be surprised. If anything, we should be prepared.